Hi everyone, my name is Gwen Kozlowski and I'm the general manager here at Exeter International. Today we are here to talk about one of my favorite regions, Central Europe, and in particular we're going to focus on Austria, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. Just to give you kind of a general overview of where this is geographically, um, it's literally in the center of Europe. So there's Austria right there in the center and you can see how close everything looks and it really makes it easy to combine these three places in particular into one achievable trip for American vacation time. So today we'll start with talking about the Czech Republic and um, actually when I'm planning trips, I really encourage you to make the trip end here because ending here, as you can see by this photo, is like ending in a fairy tale. And Prague is definitely a highlight and on so many travelers bucket list. Some of the things we like to do here um, include a VIP visit inside the Strahov Monastery Library, which you see in the top right picture. And the special thing about this is that you are in there alone while everyone else is standing behind the velvet rope. And this is in the area of Malastrana, which is that picture on the left. It's the Castle Hill area. It's got sweeping views over Prague. And we generally want to spend about a half day here with our guests. And then as you see on the bottom with that picture of Charles Bridge, um, if you were standing in that spot of the photographer behind you is Old Town. And that's the place where um, you find Old Town Square and the astrological clock, and most importantly for many of our guests, the Jewish Quarter. So when we're scheduling people in Prague, um, we're very conscious that we don't want to overschedule because it's a great city to be able to meander a bit on your own. But we do try to plan for two half days, one half day in Malastrana, one half day in Old Town, and then you've covered all the essentials before we start addressing anybody's special interests. Speaking of special interests, um, and a lot of guests ask about day trips, these are three highlights for me, but there are many more. So we have many guests that are coming to this region of Europe because they have an interest in World War II or Jewish heritage. And you'll see in that top left corner, that's Terezin. Also, some people call this Theresienstadt. This is a concentration camp that's about 45 minutes outside of Prague. Uh, visiting here takes kind of a longish half day, maybe five hours or so. And it's not like a camp you see anywhere else. It's not like Dachau. It's not like Auschwitz. It's, it's the camp that's actually in a town. The town is Terezin. And you visit um, remnants of what were the barracks and some of the rooms in the camp where they have um, artifacts and most movingly some of the drawings from the kids and what makes this place unique is it was designed to be a model concentration camp to kind of pull the wool over the eyes of the red cross so it's a really unique visit and what makes it most special you'll see on the left hand side there that is one of our survivors there aren't that many anymore but we do have um, a couple survivors in Prague that health permitting can either join guests to go to Terezin or meet them in the city center to talk about their life during the war. In the top right corner, you'll see a picture of the countryside. And this is an area about an, not quite an hour outside the city called Miskovice. It's a family and they were living in Prague and decided to uh, introduce their kids back to nature. So they left the city and the rat race and moved to the countryside and they're raising their family on this beautiful farm. And it's a real immersive and interactive experience that we do for families where they can have a craft lesson or learn how to cook a traditional Czech treat or really just to interact with the kids on the farm. I actually had um, a family that did it last year and said it was the absolute highlight of their entire visit to Prague. And then at the bottom is a gorgeous sunset view of Chesky Krumlov. Many of you already know this city. It can be done as a day trip from Prague. It's about two and a half hours each way. And it's also handy to do if you have guests that don't want to take the train as a stopping point on a drive from Chesky Krumlov to Vienna. It's a beautiful little Baroque town with a gorgeous castle that kind of sits up on the hill. And the castle itself has one of only two remaining Baroque Baroque theaters in Europe. Incidentally, the other one's in um, outside of Stockholm at Drottningholm Palace. 
So these are just three things that we can do with guests with Prague as a base. And then moving along to what is for many people the most important thing is the hotel. And there are many hotels in Prague. We could talk about a lot of different hotels. We focus on the top hotels, in our opinion, which number one is Four Seasons. This is a little bit of a larger hotel, and it sits in Old Town. They've combined four historic buildings into one cohesive hotel, but with some different decor throughout. What you're looking at here is one of the rooms that has a nod to Czech modernism or the Art Nouveau movement. There are also rooms that look way more traditional, and they're in the classical building, and then some gorgeous rooms for those who really want um, what is a very kind of old world style room in the Renaissance building. And the Four Seasons is unique in that this is the only hotel with sleeping views of the castle from their Premier River View room. There aren't that many of these rooms. They're always the ones that sell out first. If guests don't um, want a property as large as the Four Seasons or they want a different vibe, my favorite is the Augustine. I like this because it's on the other side of the river. So you feel a little bit away of the hustle and bustle of Old Town, and you're on these twisty, windy, medieval streets, and the Augustine is an actual working monastery. There are still Augustinian monks in the in the monastery that's connected to the hotel, although they're not offering, often wandering the halls. But you can see just from this picture that you still get some of the really interesting architectural features in some of the rooms, but decor is completely modern. When thinking about the Augustine, you have to remember this began its life as a Rocco Forte hotel. So the interior still kind of holds a little bit of that Rocco Forte style, even though it's now part of Starwood Luxury Collection. And um, this gives guests a five-star hotel at a bit of a lower price point than the Four Seasons, but a completely different atmosphere and a different location. And just going back to Prague itself, when I say on the other side of the river, please don't think of this if you haven't been as a, a long distance. It's all walkable. I can walk at a, an American meandering pace, not a European rushed pace, but a meandering pace from the Augustine to the Four Seasons in about 15 minutes or so. So it's really accessible and a way for someone who especially says, I want a hotel with local character. Here you go. And then we all know that there are guests who don't have the price point for either the Four Seasons or the Augustine. And my favorite four-star property is the Aria. If you had asked me two years ago, I would not have said the Aria. But you can see from the picture on this page, um, I don't know if you knew them before, but they have really freshened up their rooms and they look pretty wonderful. What I like about this as a four-star property is it puts you back on the Malastrana side, which again, not so busy with bus tours like Old Town. And the Aria is a true boutique hotel, not that many rooms, but the feature I love the most is the rooftop terrace because really it's very few hotels in Prague where you get kind of a real outside terrace kind of atmosphere. And this one has a beautiful rooftop terrace looking up to the castle and over the garden. So it really makes a nice option for people at a lower price point. And then moving along, we can talk a little bit about Austria. And really, I could do a whole webinar on Austria because I really feel like Vienna in particular is one of these places where if you haven't been or you haven't been in 10 or 15 years, you might think that it's a place you can do in a day or two. I want to mention Belvedere Palace. That's the picture of Gustav Klimt's The Kiss that you see there. Um, a couple things about Belvedere. If you have guests who have seen The Woman in Gold, the Belvedere Palace plays a huge role in that and about appropriation of art from Jews who fled or were murdered during World War II. And this year also, um, the city of Vienna is celebrating the 100-year anniversary of the death of Klimt. So at Belvedere Palace and many other places around the city, there will be special exhibitions related to this as well. Then in the top right corner, you see Spanish Riding School. I, I have to tell you, I'm not a big fan of horses. I don't love horses. Before I did this the first time, I had no idea why people were so fixated on these horses. However, we can make even a non-horse lover 
fall in love with the horses here at the Spanish Riding School. These are Lipizzan or Stallions, which are incidentally born black and turn white um, when they reach their adolescence. And we can do a number of things here to make a really special experience for guests. Of course, they can come and see a show or they can stop by a morning training session. But what is really great here is the opportunity to come into the morning training session with a special stable guide. We sit your guests down in the royal box. And while the horses are being put through their paces and practicing, a special guide from the school will say, okay, now you're seeing this horse and he's only been with his rider for this long and they've been working on this particular move. And it really, um, makes a more personal experience and one that your guests can really get involved with because they can interact with the guide and ask questions about the riders and the horses. And then the best part, as soon as you're done watching the morning training session, is stepping into the stables. It's a private visit with just you and the guide from the riding school. And you are walking among the stalls. There are groomers running around. The horses are looking at you. You can see um, where they are fed and groomed. And they might be being groomed while you're there. Or you can take a look at the really gorgeous, amazing leather in the tack room. So for a horse lover, it's an essential visit. For kids, I include it a lot because it's kind of an up-close and personal interactive visit. And even if you don't love horses, it's such a quintessential part of Vienna. It's something I try to include on most itineraries. At the bottom left-hand corner, you see a shot of St. Stephen's Cathedral. This is like the one building in town that everybody can recognize because of its multicolored roof. And it sits right in the heart of the pedestrian district. What is special about this, of course, you can go in and see it. It's a church. But we do a special private visit here where you can go down into the crypt, which is pretty macabre. So for teenagers, it's kind of a cool visit. You actually get to look through doorways to mass graves and piles of bones, which may not thrill some people. But for jaded kids, it makes a pretty interesting visit because the guide is telling stories about who was buried here and why. But the best part for me is after you visit the crypt, you get into a hidden private elevator and you head to the roof. And the roof is actually inside. You walk into a big cavernous space and you're standing on the roof of the nave below you. And you can see the winches for the chandeliers and a model of the building and the extra tiles for the roof itself. And then the guide opens the door and you step out onto the roof. And this is not anything dangerous because it has about a chest high um, banister going around it that's made of stone. So you'd have to really work to make it dangerous, but it's a really cool private bird's eye view of Vienna. And you are right up close and personal to that amazing roof and you can get some really good photography up there, some great, really cool shots of the roof. And it's, again, something that's not so historically intensive, but really interesting to add in for families as a break up between palaces or museums. And then finally, one of the quintessential palaces of Vienna, Schönbrunn, down in the right-hand corner, you're looking at the mirror hall. This is, Vienna is full of palaces. Vienna was an imperial city. A lot of times guests give me a list that is palace, 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 palace. And at the end of the day, really, how many palaces do people want to see? If you're only going to go to one palace in Vienna, Schönbrunn is the palace. We book a timed entry here, so there's no standing in line. And the guide leads our guests on a highlights route that shows about 20 rooms. Because honestly, 20 rooms in a palace is generally enough. There's always the option to do more, but this is the palace that everyone thinks of when they think of Vienna, and it's an essential visit on our program. And then moving along to some of the really wonderful day trips and extensions that you can do, um, that includes Salzburg. Please, I beg you, please stop thinking of this as the day trip. It's a 12 plus hour day trip. 
Salzburg is a fabulous destination if you love sound of music or music itself. It was the birthplace of Mozart. A lot of guests want to go here just to explore the beautiful countryside. And it's not that a day trip is not doable, but a day trip is exhausting and a whirlwind, and it almost makes the experience not wonderful. So I mentioned Salzburg here because it's great to combine if they have a couple of extra days, we can reroute the itinerary to make Salzburg work with a hotel stay. My favorite place for a day trip from Vienna is going to be the Wachau Valley, and that's what's in the top right corner. This picture is standing up in the terraced vineyards. So for people who want an authentic experience, we have the grandson of one of the region's top vintners, and incidentally, this wine region is UNESCO protected, so it's really special. And we take you out into the countryside, and then he takes over. He takes you right up into the vineyards. He knows everyone. You can have a vineyard hike or walk through the vineyards, have a picnic in the vineyards. And then he takes you to private tasting rooms that you would never, ever find on your own to taste some of the great wine from this area. And the wine here is mostly white, um, light and crisp white wines. And it's just kind of cool to be with someone who is so well connected that everyone is greeting him as you go along. There's no wish that can't be fulfilled. And it really makes a perfect day trip from Vienna to experience a bit of the countryside without investing a 12 hour day. This is a full day, so maybe six to eight hours, but it's achievable and everybody comes back happy with it. Um, I added Melk here because so many people ask about it. Melk Abbey is a stop on pretty much every single Danube River cruise. And a lot of people ask about it as a day trip. It's a beautiful abbey. If you ask me, if you're already going to Strahov Monastery in Prague, do you still need to go to Melk? Eh, I don't know. But what we do here to circumvent it feeling so much like a bus tour, because that's what Melk is full of, is we book a privately guided tour through the abbey. And so that means a Melk Abbey guide will meet your clients and take them privately through the collection here. Uh, they have religious vestments, and they talk about the history of the abbey, and then they see the beautiful library and the church itself. All in all, this private visit lasts about 50 minutes. So if you told me I want my clients to go to the countryside so they can see milk, it's not worth an hour drive to go to have a 50-minute tour to come back. But if they want to add it onto what they're already doing in the Danube Valley, then privately is the way to go, and the cost is negligible to do this. And then just in the bottom left, you see a picture of the Austrian countryside. Austria is an amazing place for self-drive guests. So for guests who just want the freedom to move around a bit and see something outside the cities, I took this picture myself um, from the window of my hotel when I was there in October. And we were based not too far from Hallstatt, which is on like every Rick Steves itinerary. And we were in a family run in in the countryside. There's hiking nearby. You can do an afternoon trip to Hallstatt when all of the bus tours are gone. There's wonderful food, and it's really a fantastic destination to add on if you have people who want to spend more time in Austria. And then I definitely want to talk a minute about the hotels in Austria. They are really of a fantastic quality. And again, Vienna is the place where I could literally talk to you about 15 or 20 hotels, but we focus on the two top, in my opinion, which is the soccer and the Park Hyatt. The big difference here, if you have guests who want a traditional hotel, if you have guests that like a family run hotel, that's the soccer. If you have guests that prefer a contemporary hotel or those that want a pool in the large fitness center and spa, that's the Park Hyatt. And then for guests who maybe have a bit of a smaller budget, the Sans Souci is the perfect four-star hotel located adjacent to the museum quarter and um, really a great fit at sometimes half the price of the other two. And then we just mentioned the Soccer Salzburg because really right now until the Goldener Hirsch renovates, it's really the only hotel of a five-star quality in Salzburg. So then we move along to Budapest and Hungary and this is a beautiful picture there of the chain bridge. And actually in the itinerary when we're doing Prague, Vienna, Budapest, I actually like it to be Budapest, Vienna, Prague. Um, Budapest, you start kind of big city, go, go, go. Vienna is imperial city, lots of art, lots of sightseeing, and then you end in Prague, like a more relaxed fairy tale like ending. 
in Budapest, um, here we have another city divided by a river. And so I don't like to overload with full days of sightseeing. I prefer most guests start with two half days, a half day on the Pest side, which is the city portion, and a half day on the Buddha side, which is the hilly castle portion. So on the Pest side, we can focus, and we often do, on the Jewish quarter, and we do have a secret behind the scenes synagogue tour here. Or if guests are really into crown jewels, we have an option of going to the parliament. These are all set tours with a parliament guide because um, it's actually still a working parliament house. And then for guests who want to experience a little bit of the imperial life and see the beautiful views when you're over on the Buddha side, you see the picture there, Fisherman's Bastion. That's one of the statues, but you actually walk up into those ramparts and have these amazing views over the Danube down to the chain bridge. You see the Four Seasons, you see the Parliament, and it's a perfect place to spend an early evening and get some fantastic views of the city. From Budapest, there are a number of day trip options. Um, a lot of day trips here involve wine. This is another great place where they can head outside the city. Lake Balaton, you see on the left, is about two hours away, and they have a nice selection of wine here in these beautiful little towns along this lake. And this is also where you want to send guests if they have an interest in porcelain, because we can also make a stop at the Heron factory on the way there. And then on the right-hand side, you see Tokai. Tokai is an actual wine-growing region that focuses on dessert wine, and it has some beautiful little towns and also a rather strong Jewish heritage background. So we can bring elements of both things in with a day trip. Well, it's a little bit long for a day trip, but maybe an overnight to Tokai. Both of these are about a two-hour drive in either direction from Budapest. And then I definitely want to talk about the hotels here because Budapest has some great options. Number one, and everyone agrees with number one, is the Four Seasons Gresham Palace. This is perfect because it is not just a fabulous hotel, but a true architectural landmark and a gorgeous Art Nouveau monument. So for guests that have the budget, this is the one. If you don't quite have a Four Seasons budget, but you still want to have a luxury hotel, the Ritz-Carlton makes a great option. It's about a 10-minute walk from the Four Seasons, and it was just renovated a couple years ago, so everything is fresh and new. And then for people who maybe don't quite have that five-star budget or want a boutique hotel, the Aria here is great. It's only been open a few years, and again, a rooftop terrace overlooking St. Stephen's Cathedral is absolutely amazing. And then just quickly to review um, other things we can do, Jewish heritage travel is very popular with guests in this region. And then also in this region, we can look at a variety of travel types here from family with really great hands-on activities. If guests like to um, go out in the countryside and do horseback riding or mountain biking, this is all possible. And then also, this is a great area for winter travel, and Christmas markets aren't just about Christmas. It's lively street food, music, and a really fun time to be there without all the crowds of summer. And then also, we can talk about guests who want to be a little bit more independent. We have sample programs for an essential Central Europe, which is Budapest, Vienna, Prague with the typical sightseeing, as well as Simply Exeter program, which is just a three-night stay in each city and an introductory walking tour with a guide for guests who really prefer a more independent pace. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, in this region, we do a variety of self-drive itineraries, sometimes just within one of the countries, sometimes with all three. It really depends on the guests and how much they want to be independent while they're touring. I also mentioned throughout some of the extraordinary experiences we have, I just a couple of more. On the left-hand side, you see a picture of a palace. That is the private Liechtenstein Palace in Vienna. It's a completely private palace entry. So for someone who maybe would not be a candidate for going to Schönbrunn with crowds of people, we can do a completely private entrance into this palace, which is owned by the Liechtenstein family of Liechtenstein. Um, we also have private wine tastings. You see a picture here of one in the cellars of Gundel in Budapest. And then really what makes all of our trips a success and really where we 
spend the most of our time with finding and vetting is our guide. And I firmly believe the guide makes or breaks the trip. And we invest so much time and effort into finding the right guides for guests. And again, this is why we always ask about your guide's personality and interests so we can match the right guide with them. Thank you so much for joining us today to learn a little bit more about Central Europe, specifically Czech Republic, Hungary, and Austria, one of our favorite corners of the world. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us if we can help you plan the perfect trip to these three countries. Our contact details are here, 800-633-1008, or send us an email at info at exeterinternational.com.